What's going on guys? Today we interviewed Josh Elizetti from Snow Teeth Whitening. Josh has an extensive history as an internet marketer and more recently has built a hundred million dollar teeth whitening company that has partnered up with the likes of Rob Gron Gronkowski, Floyd Mayweather, Kylie Jenner, all the really big greats. He's uh, absolutely one of the titans in our industry. So without further ado, let's just get straight into the interview. Enjoy. So, Josh Snow or Elizetti, what what do you go by, man? Is it do you tell people to call you Josh Snow or everybody now calls me Josh Snow, and it's just ten times easier to spell and say it. Um, so I'm, I'm I'm sticking with it for now. I mean, it's it works, uh, and it kind of straightforward tells what I'm doing right now. So um, I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna keep it now. That's it. That's it. Yeah, I had to check your name like three times to make sure I didn't like fuck up the spelling but we're all good all right man why don't you uh why don't you give everyone an idea of kind of what you do and um tell us all about snow because i mean there are probably few people that haven't heard of it um and you guys are doing some epic stuff so yeah enlighten us um so i mean who is who is josh snow um <laughs> you know I've been, I've been i've been building businesses um I didn't know I was doing it in the beginning, but I've been doing it for half my life now. So I'm 27. Um, you know, I started uh, programming websites and designing websites when I was 13, 14 years old. Um, just take care of stuff like we all do and learning how to do stuff on YouTube tutorials and uh, uh, for dummies books and all that stuff. And so I always really liked computers. Um, and so naturally I was inclined to kind of tinker on the computer and uh, didn't know I could build a business or make money like that was not the plan i wanted to go to medical school i wanted to be a doctor like that was a big big deal my dad's an immigrant from spain and you know left a great career in his home country to give me an opportunity i'm the youngest in my family none of my siblings were able to graduate college so a lot of pressure on me being the youngest like you got to go to college you got to be a doctor you got to be the one that you know really holds up the family in that sense um and you know i didn't the, like entrepreneurship is like the riskiest thing you can do, especially uh, to tell, you know, my, my, my dad or my mom that I want to be an entrepreneur um, is scary. Cause like, what is an entrepreneur? What does that even mean? Long story short, um, you know, I, I, I got into tinkering with computers, uh, got really good at building websites and designing websites. And uh, one day, um, and I was doing it for other people. So I was making, you know, 500 bucks, thousand bucks. It's a lot of money at 14 years old. And so I was, I was like, I don't know what this is, but I'm making money. Uh, apparently, I'm good at it. Uh, I can get better at it, but I'm good at it. Uh, I like it, and I love being able to, you know, buy my own food and buy my own things. So, you know, I could relieve that pressure from my parents because I'm not from a you know super wealthy background or whatever. But um, yeah, that was initially like I got hooked. I was like, dang, I like it. I'm pretty good at it, and I can make money at it. Um, I'm going to go with this. And so I just, I really fell in love with the world of um, really the, the internet, but the world of internet marketing, I think came quickly after that because the clients I was working with, um, they're just one off. Like I'd make a website, you know, they pay me 500 bucks, thousand bucks. And then um, they're like, Hey, do you know about this? Like uh, uh, Google AdWords stuff. And, uh, and I'm like, no, I don't, but I can learn it. Um, especially if you're going to pay me for it. And they're like, yeah, like we'll pay you every month, you know, to, to market our, our, the website you built. Um, so I went and I started studying that. And I also on the side was at the same time was build, I was building my own um, blogs, mostly blogs and uh, on different topics. And I learned about Google AdSense. So I put, you know, all these ads on my blog and I remember trying to calculate, um, you know, if I, if I got, uh, you know, a thousand people to click on my ads, I'd make 500 bucks today. And like, I would do all these calculations in my head. And uh, I was like, Oh, if I run around to all the, you know, Apple stores and click on my own ads, I could make 500 bucks. And like, you know, you go through these things initially. And, um, but it was fascinating to me uh, that I could build, I could build a blog. I could write content under another name, a pen name, and people would visit it and click on it. And see, at the time I didn't have, I didn't have a lot of money, so I had to learn search and optimization. So I didn't go into paid media buying or anything like that. That took probably another year or two before I really got into that. So I had to learn SEO because it was the only thing I could do because it was free. It ended up being a huge blessing um, because I, 
I had to master it. I had to understand it. And uh, it's not an easy thing. I mean, SEO is very, very difficult. Um, and so for me to understand that at 14, 15, 16 years old at a very high level, I didn't know what I was doing, you know, but then I stumbled into Black Hat World, Warrior Forum, Wicked Fire, kind of the predecessors to like stack that money in all these forums. And so, you know, I, I uh, Digital Point, Site Point, all these websites that I fell in love with, I learned that I could sell those websites I was building. But I was always fascinated. I'm like, okay, so someone's putting, like Google's putting an ad on my blog. I'm getting paid for every click. But I'm like, who's paying for the ads? Like who, you know, oh, businesses. Okay, is it big businesses, small businesses? Um, and so I always wanted to make my move to being the person that could buy the ads on people's blogs. So I went from building blogs, building websites for other people to learning SEO for myself and then learning paid media buying for my clients, then to selling those websites I was building for myself to then um, uh, moving to saying, okay, I understand paid media buying. Um, I understand how to drive sales. I had to learn copywriting. A lot of stuff self-taught. I just got lucky in the sense that I was exposed to it. And I, I grabbed the hold of it um, at a very early age. And so when you don't know what you don't know, you go into it with naivety and, um, you know, you just, you just go after it. So for me, from the ages of 13 to 17, it was really just all day long. I was on those forums, um, reading everything that I could, um, posting, asking questions. I mean, everything that I could, um, building websites for people, learning marketing, building my own website, selling them on site point marketplace, which is now Flippa. Um, and just stacking my money. And, and you know, when I was 15 years old, I bought my first car for myself. I, I sold the website for 4,000 bucks. When I bought my first car, I was on top of the moon. I was so, so proud of myself. And uh, that continued to snowball into where I am today, which is, you know, 10 years later. Um, I've been fortunate to work with some incredible people, build some incredible brands and businesses, sell some incredible brands and businesses. And today I'm most known for um, my, my baby, um, which is really our baby now, um, which is snow and snow is an oral care and oral cosmetics brand. Um, we develop products that you're typically used to seeing from brands like Crest or Colgate. Um, we believe we've reimagined and reinvented the way that people think about oral care, particularly in the whitening space. We don't sell anything we haven't created ourselves or invented ourselves. Everything's done in house. We fulfill everything in house, always have, uh, never drop shit, never done anything like that. So um, really my, my idea there was to have a business that I could run for a long period of time that could scale, you know, very large and also was very, very difficult to break into. I think oral care is one of, I would say now being this deep into it is, one of the hardest uh, industries and you know, I pay myself $60,000 a year. I make no money from, from my business. Um, it, and, uh, and I built it that way. Luckily I've got lots of other investments, lots of other businesses and brands, but snow is the one that uh, I decided to, I mean, put it on my name, um, you know, put myself out there with snow so that I could document and share that uh, entire journey, whatever happens with um, my fellow entrepreneurs. Epic, epic. And um, to give people an idea, what kind of, um, or can you give us much of an idea of like the sales volume or um, how many customers you guys have just so that people understand how big this thing is that you've actually built? We are on our way to um, hitting the 1 million uh, customer mark. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, it was, it's, it's, it's been a wild time and we've at, we added over, uh, over a hundred thousand customers. Uh, last quarter alone. So the, the growth rate is um, astronomical. Um, you know, it's an anomaly in the space. Um, we reinvest every dollar. We're, we're self-funded. So um, I put in I put in my money at this point, uh, a significant amount of my money uh, into the business, mm -hmm. but we are self-funded. Our customers are investors. Um, we are um, looking at, you know, potential uh, significant fundraise uh, right now that we're in the middle of a process with. Luckily, being a bootstrap profitable company, we do have a lot of choices. Um, but uh, but yeah, that, that's and, and then we've got you know uh, we ship to 160 countries, which is not a huge feat nowadays because you can send a product anywhere. But 
Um, we have presence in probably about a dozen countries, meaning we've got a significant reach, whether it be through celebrities, influencers, retail. Um, and we're also in three of the 10 largest retailers in the world. Um, uh, that's more recent being in offline, the whole offline world, which is something that I'm very, uh, very excited by um, and getting the opportunity, thanks to Snow, that we get to, that we get to learn. Um, this is really, like I'm a student, so I'm learning and I'm very fortunate that Snow is affording us the opportunities to learn and be challenged by retail, by international expansion, partnerships, things like that. But yeah, um, you know, we'll hit our million customer uh, not too far away from, from here. Um, our products are not cheap. Um, we are, you know, typically the most expensive option on the market. Um, so hitting a million customers um, is this, this one to be really special. I think now that we've got like $10 floss and, you know, $20 toothpaste and stuff like that, it's going to be a lot easier to hit the next million. Um, but the majority of the customers have purchased one of our systems, um, which, um, which start at 149 bucks. Yeah. Epic. And, um, so, because I think pretty much anyone can build a seven figure business. You don't have to be a genius. Um, so long as you stick at it, you know, for long enough, but with what you've done, I mean, and coming from you, what do you think is the biggest, uh, the biggest difference between doing, you know, that seven figures and building that hundred, 200 K a month, um, e-commerce brand compared to what you're doing? How, how do you make that transition, whether it's, you know, mindset or actually the things you do in the way the business is structured to start building something really massive as opposed to just staying at that seven figure level? Yeah. Um, my thing is, I, I, I realized that I was looking for, um, I, w I was kind of waiting for the, the, the idea, and this is dangerous a lot of times, but um, I had sold a business and, um, you know, growing up, I, you know, like I said, I bought my first car for 4,000 bucks and like I took the city bus everywhere. Not like a sob, sad story. Don't feel bad for me at all. But um, cars, you know, just being a big thing. So I went and, you know, I got a Bentley, a Lamborghini and like, you know, bought all Ferrari and, um, and, and bought all those cars. And I'm like, okay, this is awesome and love it. I still have cars like that. So I'm not saying that it's like a bad thing, but, um, you know, I was 21, 22 years old and I had graduated university, um, in two years. So I was in and out of there, um, at the business school, um, by 20 years old, I was completely done with my bachelor's degree. Um, 21, 22, I had my, all of my dream cars at once, you know, so there was a lot there, which is awesome. It's not like a humble brag. It's really just what I realized was, there, um, I actually fell into like a delayed burnout slash depression, um, mm -hmm. uh, for like six months of my life. It was really tough to get out of bed some days. Um, because you know, I, there was kind of this wonder boy syndrome, like, you know, Josh is young and he's smart and, you know, and he's, he, he's, he's a millionaire and like, look at all his cars. And like, what is he going to do next? And I remember going to Google and searching like, what, what was Steve Jobs doing at 21 years old or 22 years old? What was Mark Cuban doing at 21, 22? And like, I felt this pressure of like, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, measuring dicks, you know, I was like, I was like, I was like looking at the, you know, other people's success and saying, and gauging my own happiness off of that and saying, wow, whatever I build next needs to be like the apple. It needs to be huge. It needs to be this. And that pressure like really, really started to wear on me. Um, and at a certain point I was like, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to chill. I'm going to invest. I'm going to advise. I'm going to kind of just the businesses that I was still running, uh, just kind of let them grow on their own. And like, just kind of chill. I'm just going to chill for a bit because I was, I was struggling for like six months straight of like, what am I going to do next? I'm like, and I remember I, I got this um, sheet of paper and I wrote down things I didn't like, things I did like. Um, and so, you know, I wrote, I wrote stuff on there. Like, uh, for example, I like to work with um, uh, energetic people, people that uh, that, that are working on something for more than just a job, you know, because uh, it's, it's as much a job to me as it is everyone else on the team. Um, just because I own some equity doesn't mean that it's not something that I, I have to do, but um, the mission, I think the mission is, and it's like, it's cliche to say like the mission, you know, what's your mission statement, but the mission is, was, was, was huge for me. I, I felt like I needed a reason to get out of bed um, and it wasn't money anymore. 
And that was kind of, that was kind of effed up for me. I like that kind of screwed up a lot of things in my head because money is like the easiest thing to gauge off of. Like it's, it's, it's this, uh, the goalpost keeps going up. It's, a, it's, it's kind of elusive. And it's like, when I make a million, when I make 10 million, when I make a hundred million, you have this like binary quantitative uh, goalpost that you can see in front of you, you can touch, it's tangible. But what if I said, I'm seeking happiness? That's not a tangible, quantifiable um, um, thing that you can put on a wall and say, I'm going after that. They go, uh, Dimitri, why are you working that? And you're like, what is that? And so then I had to understand, I had to break down for myself, what does happiness mean for Josh? And one of the things I realized is that I became addicted to the joy of achievement. Um, I, I had to keep doing stuff. Like it could have been anything. It could be cleaning my office and like checking something off. Like I needed that reason to get out of bed and feel accomplished. I wanted to be around other people. And frankly, I wanted to be held accountable for my success or my failure. I wanted to put it out there. And so, and I wanted to be proud of what I was working on. So I, that, I kind of wrote those things down. And that's when I ended up going, you know, started preparing for jaw surgery. When uh, I started to you know, realize that there was an opportunity in oral care, um, that oral care just was not a sexy thing. It was a, com it's a commoditized space, impossible. And I, I needed something extremely difficult. That was the other thing. Because just doing things that, are, that you do all the time or that are easy, for me, it, got, it, it started to wear on me. Um, and I felt like I wasn't growing. Like I wasn't like deep down inside growing. I'm not just saying like building a seven-figure business over and over and over again. But like, what was I actually doing? Like, what was the, what was the impact, you know, of selling, you know, fidget spinners online and then, you know, or drop shipping fidget spinners? Like, what is, where is my passion there, my mission? Like, what am I doing there other than using it as a vehicle to learn stuff, which is fine. But for me, I was seeking a higher purpose. And I realized that I'm always going to be running a business of some sort. I'm always going to be involved in stuff. But this time around, I want it to be different. When I stumbled into the oral care market, uh, while getting my jaw surgery and prepping for that, I realized that it was, it's, I said, it's going to be very difficult. I'm probably going to have to put all my money into this business because no one's going to believe in it the way I'm going to believe in it. Um, and I, ha I have to go all in and that's going to get me up in the morning. And I'll tell you what, you go all in on something and you see progress and you treat something like it's truly, you know, your life's mission it will pick you up in the morning. It will, it will grab you out of bed and pull you out. And some days are better than others. I have bad days every single week. Some days I don't want to get out of bed. Some days I'm struggling. But I will tell you, snow in many ways not only gave me a purpose, in many ways it, 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 I feel like it saved my life in that, in that sense. And so I feel like I'm on a mission to serve what we built snow for and, and to serve my team, to serve our customers and to just keep charging on. And every time I realize, like if I have a feeling of like, ah, shiny object syndrome, or let me just sell this business and do something else. Every time I have that feeling, because it happens a lot, um, because things get tough and you just want to give up. It's always easier to give up. I realize that it's, it's, it's bigger than me. Like it's not, it's not about me anymore. And I think when you build something big and you let people in, you build something that is bigger than yourself. Um, and I feel like, I want to challenge any entrepreneur who might be in a similar position to think about that. At least I'm not saying do what I do, but like just to think about that. Cause I wish, I wish someone would have sat me down and said, Hey, like take a step back and like, think about what you're doing and it's okay to make a lot of money. You know, don't feel guilty. Cause I had some guilt too. Like I make a lot of money. It's easy to me. Making seven figures is easy for me. Like that's what I thought in my head. And I felt a little bit guilty because you know, you know, my family has come from a lot of money. So like, why, why, like, why am I spending, you know, 500 bucks on a pair of shoes when there are people that can't even buy a $1 pair of shoes? Like I got in my head a lot. So I think this mission and what we're doing with snow and documenting it and sharing it for the entrepreneur community has made it about more than myself. It's no longer just Josh's business and Josh is cool. It's like, look at what we're doing and letting people in and let, letting them enjoy and share in that growing process has given me a reason to get out of bed yeah well i um i want to get into the marketing stuff but before like you've brought up some interesting points so um a question on that um 
Was it was it difficult in the beginning to to let people in? Because you've got like investors and um, I mean, you've got partners as well. And I mean, for me personally, I'm kind of at that stage in my journey now where I need to start letting go so that other people can also, you know, take the reins and not not only in like a management perspective. Um, yeah, so not not only in a like letting go from a, a management perspective, but being able to bring on investors and not necessarily have the whole pie to yourself anymore. Um, was that a difficult process for you kind of giving some up to, I guess, have a bigger pie? Like, It's uh, it's uh, you can hear me, right? Yeah, I got you. Yeah. That man, that's, that's, that's a great question. It was it challenging. Absolutely. Is it still challenging? Absolutely. But I will tell you this, yeah. you got to, you got to rip the bandaid off. Um, my, my mentor, uh, uh, Mr. Mort Fleischer, uh, he's 83 years old, going to be 84 this year. He's seen it all. He's been an entrepreneur for 60 plus years, three public companies. He's amazing. And he goes, Josh, he goes, I know you're like, a, you're like a cowboy, wild west entrepreneur. You like to fire, fire, ready, aim. You like to just, you know, do things. He goes, don't, he goes, don't be cheap um, because you're going to end up having to hire the right people. But he's talking about lawyers, accountants, things like that. He says, don't be cheap if you're building something legitimately um, because you're going to have to come back and hire those people anyway and it's going to be more expensive and you're going to be in trouble or whatever. So he's like, you know, hire, do it the right way. Um, and the, I, I thought I got it at the time. He told me this like four years ago. He goes, Josh, he's like, you're not, you're not very open about your like finances and you're like, um, and he's like, and he's like, look, I get it. I was like you, I'm the same way, but, uh, look at me now, three public companies. You want to talk about being private? I have, they know everything about everything. So, but what I've learned is that when you let the village in, they help you raise the baby and the baby becomes stronger. It becomes more skilled. It's maybe the resilience mm -hmm. uh, of that baby um, becomes uncanny. Uh, it's, it just really, what I've learned now and what I wish I would have told myself, even starting snow day one is let people in, not, not just let people in and let them, you know, mess up what you're doing or something like that. And don't have that fear that they're going to mess things up. But, let people in philosophically, metaphorically, and in, in actuality of here's what we're building. What do you think about it? Or what are your thoughts on that? And my number one, here's my number one problem I have in my, in my life, I think, um, asking for help. That is probably um, the number one problem I have uh, in, my, in my head in terms of getting things done. I have a hard time of asking for help. And it's not even... It's not even because of, of, of pride. I've really spent a lot of time thinking about psychologically why I have such a hard time asking for help. Um, and I think being, real, being the youngest in my family by, by a, a long shot, um, seven or eight years is the closest sibling to me. I, I had to figure out a lot of things. I have great parents. I have great family and all that. But I had to figure out a lot of stuff on my own. Um, and I've always kind of been in my own head, like introspective. And so... I, I don't want to um, bother people and ask them for help. Like if my, if my parents were busy with the other siblings, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to ask them for anything because I knew that they were busy and, and not to say it's bad parenting. It made me strong. It made me resilient, but unfortunately I can't open my stupid mouth sometimes and let people in. And I will tell you, if you want to build something big, if you want to have a, a huge impact, if you want to feel fulfilled, let people in as soon as you can go on anywhere, go on clarity.fm and just talk to people, hire a consultant, like just talk to people, get people involved. You don't have to pay them. Just go walk on the, the street and be like, Hey, can I tell you about my idea? And it's just a random person. Like until someone listens to you, the more you get it out there, the more real it becomes. It's something. And, and I am so blessed and, and honored to have, the audience that I have now of hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs who follow me, most are e-commerce all over the world. And on days when I'm feeling down, when I'm feeling upset, when I'm frustrated, when I want to quit, I'll get a message that says, Hey Josh, I watch all your podcasts. I watch this, I watch that. And you're the reason I'm still going and things like this. And I get those messages. But in addition to that, 
um, I've learned how to ask for help better. I'm still not there, but because I've got this army, I call them my snow troopers. I've got these snow troopers that whenever I put something on Facebook immediately, like I posted today, Hey, does anybody know anyone at calm the app calm or headspace immediately within five minutes, I'm texting the founders of both companies are billion dollar companies within five minutes. I'm texting them. And I think it's, and, and, and it's kind of silly that it took having to get to this point to learn how to ask for help. But those are things I would have done. I would have learned to learn to ask for help and ask it a lot. And two, um, uh, you know, be open with your business. You don't have to go running around showing everyone your, your, your revenue, but like be open with your struggles as, as much as you are about your successes and learn to ask for help. Those are things that I think have, have honestly changed my life. They changed my mental state. They changed my feeling overwhelmed. I still feel overwhelmed, but what happens is I don't ask for help for so long that by the time I go, Oh, let me ask for help now. By the time, like by the time they figure it out, I might as well just do it because it's already late. So like I end up screwing myself over um, and I'm a procrastinator and I know that. And so I end up screwing myself over and it's caused so much stress in my life that I'm learning now that less money uh, and less headache is way better than more money and more headache. Um, I, I've learned that the hard way for me at least. Um, I, I don't have any aspirations to be a billionaire. Um, a lot of those thoughts are fleeting now that I'm older and I've I'm, and mature and I'm still young, but like older in terms of doing this for over 10 years, I've learned kind of what matters to me. I like convenience. You know, I love the freedom to be able to work wherever I want to work. There are certain things that I'm not willing to negotiate moving forward. And I feel like I feel very thankful to snow because it gave me the opportunity to learn those things about myself. Awesome. Awesome, man. Um, I'm glad we're having this conversation because I think it's really going to help a lot of people. Um, all right, let's get more into the meat and potatoes of snow now with, uh, the marketing stuff that you guys have been doing. Um, I mean, from my understanding, there's two things that you've kind of become really well known for on the marketing front. One influences and two, um, like having an omni channel marketing approach and buying media on all sorts of different, uh, platforms and stuff like that. So let's, uh, let's get into the influences first. Um, tell us about your approach to all of that and, um, I mean, what you're, you're so well known for with the, uh, with the epic influencer stuff. Yeah, for sure. Um, so my, my thinking on the whole influencer, um, actually I'll, I'll take it all. I'll take you all the way back. I remember I think it was 2014 or 2013. It was somewhere around there that I was seeing might've been 2013. I was seeing, um, influencer marketing on Instagram for the first time. Like I was studying it for the first time and I was so like fascinated by it. And immediately my head went to affiliate offers. I was like, Oh, I can go and get a diet peel affiliate offer, get some good looking girls to post about it. Um, and you know, I'll make affiliate commission and imagine if I had a thousand girls post about it, like that's where my head went initially. And then I started to see, Um, and I I wasn't alone because I saw what the first brands that were using influencer marketing at scale, you know, fashion Nova, of course, a huge successor. There are a lot that really crushed it, revolved, et cetera. But initially there were the, the, the scammy weight loss teas and like things like this that are reminiscent of, uh, you know, the affiliate marketing world taking advantage of this new, uh, way of driving customers and so I started to study that and see which brands were um, doing posts over and over and over again, which meant it probably worked, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, my, my buddy Arvin, I was watching what his, uh, I didn't know him at the time, but his company shreds and seeing what they were doing with their influencers. Like I was watching all that. That's uh, Arvin, Arvin Lull is who you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, we ran traffic for him ages ago, quite, maybe like. 18 months ago, we did some, uh, some of his stuff. Marvin's a great guy. I mean, talk about, talk about resilience and, uh, he's a brilliant, brilliant guy. And I'm honored to call him a friend. And, uh, you know, I was watching, I was watching what, what these guys were doing and I was, I was getting, I was dipping my toe in it too. You know, I was taking a few of my brands and doing a few things and trying to understand it, you know, 2013, 2014. And, uh, it worked out because what I, what I, what I was thinking is, 
influencer marketing has been around for thousands of years. Um, you know, you get someone you like or someone that's well liked to talk about something you're trying to sell. I mean, yeah, you know, one of the best uh, ones I study were tobacco companies. And so tobacco companies um, would go and get, you know, uh, John Wayne, you know, huge actor or whatever, and they'd get them in their commercials and they'd get the female supermodels and stuff like that. And so they figured out how to sell tobacco. That's how everyone's like, oh, will influencer marketing work for my business? I'm like, it worked for tobacco. So I think it's going to work for your business. Um, so I studied that and I realized, look, people buy from who they like and trust. You're a new brand. I don't know you enough to like you. And if I don't even know you enough to like you, I certainly don't trust you. But I like and trust Nicki Minaj or Floyd Mayweather. You know, like I like and trust that person. I'm going to at least see what this person's talking about. So, you know, you think about it, you got someone who Floyd Mayweather, um, you know, one of the, one of the most successful athletes in history um, and, and known globally who has won 50 fights, who has spent millions of dollars becoming the best in the world and who has made hundreds of millions of dollars in the ring, uh, if not a billion dollars, like, you know, you get this guy and if you're able to work with someone like that for whatever, 200,000, 300,000, 500,000, who cares? But you're able to, you're able to leverage what he spent his entire life building. And he, he's able to sprinkle some of that on a new brand. The way I always explain it is let's say, I, I uh, let's say Dimitri, you moved to Arizona here with me. And, uh, and let's say I know a lot of people. I'm really well known here. You move to town and I go, I go, Dimitri, come, come to dinner with me. I'm going to have a dinner and I'm going to bring the most influential people if, in the city and I want you to meet them. Well, you come to dinner with me and I stand up and I say, everybody, I would like you to meet a very close friend, one of the smartest guys I know, uh, the, most, the nicest and most trustworthy man I've ever met. And he just moved here. So can you guys please give him a warm welcome? Here's Dimitri. Now all of a sudden they go, oh, hi, Dimitri. How's it going? Huh? What, what, you know? doing that third party referral with influence. If Kylie Jenner tells Kim Kardashian that she should talk to you about her marketing, she's probably going to do it. But now you think about word of mouth marketing at scale, that's influencer marketing. It's, it's word of mouth at scale. Now it's fragmented and it's different, but a virtual version of word of mouth, which is the best form of marketing is word of mouth. So, and it's the stickiest. So I saw that I said, well, word of mouth marketing, influencers sprinkling their magic dust on my new brand and people are at least going to give me a shot and, tr and try out the product or at least go on the website or at least follow us on Instagram. They're going to do something. It's now my job because now that I've been given, for example, if I bring you to dinner and you make a complete ass out of yourself, you drink too much, you break shit, you're, you're cussing, whatever. I gave you the chance. You were supposed to follow it through. That's the brand's job. The, the, the influencer makes the introduction to the audience, puts you, on the, puts you on stage. It's your job to get them to come back and make them fans of your own versus just fans of Kylie Jenner and she's recommending you. So that's what we did influencer marketing. And when we realized from a tactic side of things that we could run ads from Floyd Mayweather's Facebook account to his tuned in audience so that there's that authentic appeal that made a lot of sense. And then recently we said, well, why don't we do that with smaller influencers? If they have 50,000 followers, who cares? Let's run ads from their page and let's reach out to more people and, and build that ripple effect that you see. And that's the thing with snow is that you'll, you'll see us on YouTube with a funny ad and then you'll go to Snapchat, see us there in the discovery. Then you go to TikTok, and then you'll see your favorite Instagram or post us and then your sister using it at night. So what it does is creates this, this, tri uh, this circular selling effect, this influence, circle of influence, and it just hits you from every area. And I would say only 10% of our customers woke up in the morning and said, I want to wipe my teeth. Let me see the best options out there. I would say the majority of people woke up, opened the Instagram app, were scrolling and hanging out, and they saw Floyd Mayweather using something in his mouth. And they're like, what the heck is this? So, you know, we are very top of the funnel in that aspect. And there's nothing better than a, an influencer or a celebrity to crack, uh, crack open that introduction to your product and brand from the top of the funnel. Now you get saucy with it 
and you do uh, mid funnel and lower funnel videos where it's Floyd Mayweather saying, yo, what's going on? You, Dimitri, you know, not exactly your name, but yo, what's going on? You came to the website, you added it to the cart, you didn't check out. Um, you know, why don't you use the coupon code money and order today and then lower the funnel. Like, Hey, thanks for buying. It's on its way to you. But before make sure you check out our extras, you know, like you can get really, um, uh, into, uh, creative with it. And you kind of have to, because a lot of brands are jumping on the influencer marketing train. A lot of brands are doing, and it's not 2014 anymore. You can't pay a girl 5,000 bucks for a post. If she's got, you know, 5 million followers, she's going to want 25,000, not 5,000. And she's not going to want to put on her post or feed. She's going to want to do a story, which means it disappears in 24 hours. And she's not going to use a coupon code because she thinks it's cheap. So like all your attribution, all your reach goes to, goes to hell. So it's not the good old days. So that's why as a media buyer or with your media buying team, if you can enhance that content, you're going to win uh, in, in the long haul. Yeah. And, and because it's not 2014 anymore, like you were saying, you, you don't, you can't put the money out anymore and just get it straight back in terms of a, a direct ROI. So typically, um, or in more practical terms, how long and what does it look like in terms of actually getting that money back? Because a lot of people are scared to do this because to them, they just think, oh, I'm just getting impressions. I'm not going to make sales. When do the sales actually start coming um, as a result of that first top of funnel interaction? I mean, we, we, we drive sales, we drive sales straight away using the influencers content okay. in a Facebook ad, driving them to convert. Like the majority of our conversions happen within that 24 hour period. Um, you know, probably 80 to 90% of our sales come within 24 hours. Um, now we have an omni channel presence, you know, we're, we're everywhere and we've built a brand over close to four years now, but even in the beginning, yeah, uh, we would still drive conversion right right out the gate. But this is what I this is what I tell people. And I'll I'll talk to entrepreneurs that are making you know fifty million dollars a year, and they'll be like, uh, "Oh man, you, you really think it's worth paying you know Nicki Minaj a hundred grand to to do a post for us? Like, should we use a coupon code? Like, how how much money did you make off the Floyd Mayweather post?" I go, I never tracked it, and they go, "What?" I said, "I I don't I have no idea." It's, it's it, when you're working with big celebrities, it's about the brand spillover effect. Now, the ads that we ran Floyd Mayweather with, I can see the ROAS, right? 3.5 ROAS, we spent 400,000 bucks, we made $200,000 profit or whatever. Like, okay, we doubled our money, net, net. But what you're looking for, if you're, if you're building a brand, this will make sense. If you're, if you're running a drop shipping store, you're just looking for your next hustle or like you're, you're looking for the next creative, then this is not going to make as much sense to you, but uh, for you, um, what I look at is the long-term brand equity boost that I get from someone like Floyd Mayweather saying, this is the best teeth whining kit money can buy. I can't tell you how many people I have met that say, oh yeah, you work with Floyd Mayweather, don't you? How is he? You have like from, even from a personal appeal, like if, if I'm being selfish, even from a personal appeal, you know, all of my teammates on our team like can say that we've worked with Floyd Mayweather, we've worked with Rob Gronkowski, you name it. People pick their favorite celeb that, that they follow, that they saw our ad of, and they remember that. And they go, oh, yeah, you're Rob Gronkowski's business partner. You're Kylie Jenner's business partner. Like, that's what they think. And the retailers come calling and they go, oh, we see your ads everywhere. You work with all the celebs. Wow, it's going to be huge. Let's do a big launch party for, the, for you know, launching with us. So uh, that's, that's a long answer. Short answer is what you can do is you can start small. You can start with a thousand dollars, start with $2,000, start with $5,000, but you're wait, you're wasting money somewhere in your business. Anyway, this is some of the best money you can spend because guess what? Even if the content doesn't perform, you have content and the content is the new currency in this world. And you will never have enough. If you're building a brand or building a business, you will never have enough. I don't care what you sell. You will never have enough content. So for $200 to have someone, take a picture of your product. Think about it. They're, they're getting done up. They're doing their makeup. They're cleaning. They're, they're putting themselves together, putting an outfit on, getting the photographer who could be their husband. It could be their friend. Sometimes they're actually getting a photographer. They're putting a lot of work for you to just PayPal 200 bucks and then be mad because you didn't get enough sales off of it. 
it's your fault for not understanding the value of content and how to you, uh, utilize that content across channels, put it on your website, make a, a, a mashup video of all the people using it. People are going crazy for these headphones. Boom, 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 boom. That it's your fault for not utilizing the content. Now, what I would say, and I could save you a million dollars because I lost a million dollars on it, is people in the middle, which means if they have, if they have zero to 50,000 followers, great run ads from their page. You're going to make three times your money all day, every day. Um, and if you don't make any money from it, you got content for almost for free. So that's great. If it's Nicki Minaj, it's Nicki Minaj. And if you make money from it, you probably, you can make $10 million from it. You can make $1 million from it. But what you will make is you'll make a huge impression with your brand and the stickiness and long-term power of your brand, how much it's worth. If you want to sell your business one day, Nicki Minaj could add $5 million to your, your purchase price over time because that's where people connect to it. Um, the people in the middle are people that, you know, maybe it's a buff guy that just posts pictures with his shirt off and he's got, you know, 2 million followers, but he doesn't really have influence. He doesn't really have an affinity and connection. It's just Instagram. That's why I like YouTube a lot because YouTube is, Hey guys, what's going on? So I'm going to take you on my journey today. I'm going to go shopping for shoes. You know, I love shoes. You're like, you're, you're tuned in, you're watching and you're like, I love this person. Oh my God. Where Instagram is like, that's so cute. Like, like it's very transactional. So um, unless it's someone well known. So I'm saying the people in the middle, you can lose a lot of money on because they're going to ask for $20,000 for a post. You're going to be like, Oh, 5 million followers. I only need a hundred people to buy to break even. Don't do math like that. Every time I've done math like that, I've lost money. Um, so you have to be willing to start small and, um, stop trying because look, our job as entrepreneurs is to be optimistic. Our job is to live in the future. And we go, Oh my God, this girl's got 7 million followers. She wants to post about it. She only wants seven grand. Um, you know, I would start small and I would, I kind of work your way up The people in the middle are where you're going to lose a lot of money. Anyone charging between 2,500 and 25,000 is where you're going to lose a lot of money. Um, anyone over 25,000 is probably a real celebrity that you can use in your marketing that people will recognize anyone under $2,000 is pretty much content and you can run it from their page. We've made two, $300,000 in profit off of people with 5,000 Instagram followers and we run from their page. So it's not like you need to have Nicki Minaj to run from it's, it's the diversity and being able to swap in and out of. Um, and you can throw in a Nicki Minaj here and there, you know, two years from now, get a Nicki Minaj. But in the meantime, um, try to activate your customers, try to activate smaller people and work your way up. Epic. Epic. And now moving on to the, um, multi-channel or omni platform, whatever you want to call it. Um, what are you guys running outside of Facebook in terms of paid media? So we run, uh, we run everywhere. <laughs> um, yeah. I would say, you know, I would say um, we're still, we're still pretty heavy on, on Facebook and Instagram, obviously. Um, they've got the most mature algorithms. They got the most uh, mature data sets. Um, but I see this with, I saw this happen with Google um, from 2000. I mean, I didn't know it at 2004, but I'm saying from 2004 to 2010, maybe 2012. Um, you know, attorneys, lawyers used to get $1 clicks, 10 cent clicks. And it was a heyday. Oh my gosh. Just imagine if you could have signed up and they said, hi, we're Google. We're coming out with Google ad AdWords or Google ads or AdWords. We're calling it AdWords. And you can now buy ads when people search and you're like, huh, sounds like an interesting idea. I'll buy an ad. It's 12 cents for a click. Okay. Now, if you're a lawyer, you, you have to look at Google as like, a negative, like you're going to, you're going to break even and it's going to build your brand. That's what happens with the, the network effect on, on paid media. So Facebook will never, and this is my opinion, Facebook will never just ran like we had COVID and things like that. So which is great. Election season will r ruffle some feathers, but it's not going to tomorrow. It's not going to be $1 to, you know, or 10 cent clicks just because like it just Facebook is too mature. Um, so we've, we've made <laughs> a painful but conscious effort over the last 18 months to diversify our, our media mix away from Facebook. Um, we realized that we started to, and not everybody's different, but when you spend a lot of money, I think we spent $5 million in April 
um, on Facebook ads. So, you know, when you spend $5 million in 30 days, uh, you know, a lot of things, a lot of other things happen. And what happens is that you're not getting, you know, people that say they're getting seven, eight, nine X ROAS is because they're spending a hundred dollars a day. Like that's great. And love that. Stay there. If that's what you want, stick with it. You're lucky to get two or three times ROAS when you're spending a million, two million, three million dollars a month. That's just how it is. I try to say this over and over again. Facebook has maybe a hundred million people who actually buy stuff online and 2 billion users. Everyone's fighting worldwide for the 100 million buyers. Everyone's fighting for them. And in America, it's even worse. So the problem is the more you spend, the more that uh, Facebook is going to have to hypnotize the person to become a buyer. And by the way, the, the buyers in the diminishing return zone are not very good buyers. They don't have law, lifetime values low. They're buying because of a discount. They're buying because you harassed the shit out of them. This is my example. Um, and you might like this and you can steal this from me. Um, okay, you, you're, you're, you meet Mark Zuckerberg in a coffee shop. And uh, you go, hey, Marky, uh, I, got, I got a job for you. Um, how many uh, uh, phones can you sell in this coffee shop? There's about 100, 100 people in here. How many do you think you sell? He goes, uh, I mean, I'm sure I could sell at least one. You go, okay, if you sell one, what would you charge me for that? He's like, I mean, it probably wouldn't take that long to sell one of them. Just give me 10 bucks if I sell it. You go, all right, sounds good. I'll give you 10 bucks if you sell a phone. He goes around, he comes back, he goes, I sold it. Give me my 10 bucks. You go, oh, wait, 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 Mark, before you leave. Um, I've got three more that just came in. Can you go back to the same 100 people and sell three more phones? He's like, ah, I kind of already asked a few of them. I don't want to ask them again. I'll give you 25 bucks each one you sell. He goes, all right, uh, 25 bucks. Okay, I'll try. I'll try to sell three of them. He goes, he comes back, goes, I did it. I sold three more. You go, great, Mark. I need you to sell 10 more now to the same 100 people. He goes, they, I already asked everybody. Nobody even wanted a phone. I couldn't even sell the three that you told me to sell. I'll give you $80 a phone that you sell if you sell 10 of them. Um, he goes, wow, that's pretty good money. I mean, I'll give it a shot. So what happens is he keeps coming back. You keep telling him more and more. And that's like clients telling you to scale, scale, scale. And then they go, why is ROAS dipping when we're scaling? What happened? Oh, I need to go to another agency. You know, that's the problem is they're not understanding the supply and demand issue. And these are things that are outside of our control. So what happened is that the marketplace has turned, and I'm speaking for all marketplaces, it's turned to a war on content. So creative, a war on creative, the more aggressive you can be. Can you sneak before and afters in there? And like, you have to really like get all creative where before in 2012, 2013, you can put up an ad for a, this bottled water and it would go viral. So like that, those were the old days. So we've started to diversify. We moved to Snapchat. We've moved to Pinterest. Uh, Pinterest is like one of the worst platforms in the sense that they're so discovery and high level. They're going to take credit for everything at the bottom of the funnel you have to really understand at our scale, you have to understand attribution intimately um, and you'll never get it perfect. But Google, Google is going to show, Google is going to show 18 times ROAS. Um, but that's because they're searching snow teeth whitening and they're ready to buy because they saw the YouTube ad, but then they saw the Pinterest ad, but then they clicked on the Snapchat ad, but then they saw Kylie Jenner post and then they heard it from their mom at a party and then they finally Googled it. So it's, it's so fucked up now, this whole attribution and multi-touch and every platform is trying to take credit for it. So what we realized is we said, okay, let's take a step back and let's look at the assisted conversion path and let's understand where does everybody sit? If you're looking at Pinterest for conversions, I mean, they're going to, they're going to claim they're converting everyone. But if you look at them for assisted, uh, um, straight up conversions, last click, they suck. I'm talking about $800 to get a customer for a $40 purchase. That's what it's going to come out to. But if you say, okay, I've got Facebook ads running. Here's historically what I can expect. If I spend a thousand dollars, I make $3,000. Now, if I add Pinterest in, does it assist these conversions? Does my CPA drop? Is the intent higher? What's going on here? And so it's like you, you start to add in different elements to see, what helps with that journey. And that's why our buying path went from seven days to 24 hours. Because when you come to our website, we're hitting you on every single platform you, you live on. 
until you buy. And so it, it shortens the conversion path, but a lot of times at the expense of a higher CPA, a higher customer acquisition cost. So you have to balance all those things. And I know I'm going deep, but it's just like a warning to you that if, when you spend $5 million in a month, you've got to have, you've got to have everything tracked. I mean, you've got to know everything that's going on, but I would say, what am I bullish on? I'm bullish on Amazon ads. We love Amazon now. I hated them before. I love them now. Amazon ads, um, having fun with TikTok. We're actually spending a good amount of money on TikTok um, and working with a lot of uh, creators there. It's still pretty cheap to get someone with 20 million followers to post for you, like dirt cheap compared to Instagram. It's like the Instagram old days. So influencer marketing, I'm very bullish on with TikTok, especially if your audience is younger, but even if it's not, there's still a market there. Um, you know, Snapchat, if you're not doing retargeting at least on Snapchat, you're, you're, you're missing out. You know, even if only a fraction of your customers are on there, you should be retargeting there. And, you know, I'm, I'm loving Google shopping again. I'm loving YouTube again, because the long form and mid form content and kind of assisting in that process. Um, so we've diversified quite a bit and now we're on radio. We're launching our TV. Um, now that we're moving into, into retail stores. So we're starting to diversify podcast ads, something that we're starting to spend more money on. I think we spent 50 grand last month, um, you know, testing, figuring things out there. So just kind of expect spreading our wings, you know, three and a half, four years later, we're starting to spread our wings, but we're still hooked on the, the crack of, of Facebook ads and Instagram ads. I mean, it's, it really is like a drug. Facebook and Google are drugs. And what happens is the more you take of them, the more you need to take of them. And I challenge entrepreneurs uh, to, to pause your Facebook ads and Instagram ads for two weeks. Just completely pause them. Does your business grow? Does your business go to zero? Do you go bankrupt? What happens if you pause your Facebook interface for 30 days? Try it. If your business goes to shit, you've got to start diversifying. You've got to start thinking about yourself because Facebook's not going to go anywhere, but it's also not going to get cheaper. So you definitely want to look. The problem is where else do you go? I gave you some of them, TikTok, Snapchat, Pinterest, Google, or Google, uh, Facebook and Google. Outside of Facebook and Google, there's not really much else to go. Amazon ads, but start to think even outside of the computer because we spend less money to acquire a customer offline than we do online. It's cheaper for us to get someone to buy someone to buy us in stores than it is to buy online now because of how expensive it is. Wow. Um, how are you guys tracking and getting on top of those attribution issues? Are you guys using like a software or something or? I can't tell you how many times we've been pitched on it's, all yeah. kinds of stuff. Um, you know, we, we, we're heavy on Google analytics, <laughs> you know, it's, it's not perfect, but, um, you know, we try our best. We try to tag as best as we can. We try to understand fluctuations. Um, I try to, I, you know, I try to, I try to make love to my analytics at least once a day because I need to understand when some, I can almost feel it in my blood when uh, a page is down or the Shopify interface is down or a retailer is not selling well. Like I can almost feel it. It's like a weird you know, it's all in my head, but I can like feel when something's off or I can spot it right away. I can see when the revenue per visitor starts to take a dip and immediately we ring alarms everywhere um, to see what's going on. You know, is a coupon code not working? Is a, a page not working? Do we push something live in the middle of the night? Happens a lot where it broke something, you know, like what is going on? So we kind of really set, um, set those alarms. Now, in terms of a tool, we use all kinds of tools, right? Like we use Convert, we use Google Analytics. We, I, I can't tell you how many tools we use. We probably spend twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month on software tools like that. Um, my, the thing I look at is I'm looking at um, our Tableau, like our kind of uh, graphical outputs of what's in Google Analytics and kind of understanding trends, but it's still mainly Google Sheets, Google Analytics, understanding our traffic mix, um, uh, conversion rate, revenue per visitor, top converting pages. These are things that Google Analytics is pretty good at. It's not perfect. Um, but I don't know, have you seen any tools that maybe, you know, a tool that I haven't tried? Uh, yeah. Lately we've been playing around with Hyros a bit. Alex Becker's software. Have you heard of that one? Oh yeah. 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 I, I haven't had a chance. I gotta, I should hit Alex up. Uh, check that out. Yeah. How is it? That it's, it's been decent, but we're, so we're using it for the agency with our ads just because we've got so much 
content and organic that really influences how our ads perform. So we're, we're kind of tracking the entire client journey because again, it's a high ticket service, right? So it, uh, it's, it's not like anyone's ever going to come in, click an ad and then start working with us. Um, so that's why we're using it. So I don't have too much insight on the, the e-com tracking side, but, um, he's doing some cool stuff and they're, they're building at the moment, they're building a, um, I think it's going to be in the form of like a Chrome extension or a plugin of some sort, um, where the metrics are actually going to come through ads manager as well. Um, in terms of, um, I don't know, they're going to like create an enhanced Facebook ads dashboard. I think don't, don't quote me on that though. Um, and that's, that's something that they're doing in beta now um but he's doing some cool stuff i think it's it's worth keeping an eye on i'm gonna keep an eye on it you know what's what's uh, what's what sucks about being being large in terms of how much money we spend on media is that if we like we can't even we can hardly even work with agencies anymore because the mm. the scale is so math there's so much going on that um if one thing gets thrown off you know, like it screws everything up. I mean, you spend if you spend five million dollars a month, and one thing goes off, you can lose three hundred thousand dollars in a day. So, like the the and, and what sucks about that? I, I'll tell you the truth. What sucks about that is that I don't get to try a lot of the stuff I want to try. Um, I don't get to like like I don't I can't hit up Alex and and set up Hyros tomorrow without talking to my team mm-hmm. and just kind of see how it does. I can't touch anything on that website without having a meeting about it first. Really, unless something's broken because there are so many people involved in the um, synchronization of that dance of what goes on from advertising to, to conversion, to fulfillment, to support. There's just so much going on and so many people who are in charge of those scenarios. It's beautiful because I get to focus on uh, uh, brand development and new products and, and sales and raising money and all that other stuff. But um, yeah, I would say, attribution is the it's never gone better this 10 years later 20 20 years later probably still won't be the best um and, you know and and so we can't we're not able to move as quickly as we used to and i will say that that's something that the bigger you get it does become a risk management issue um and also once people learn how to use google analytics now you have to train 20 people to use a different software I, I am realizing and, and I, am, I am maturing to be the leader who can lead a large organization. But I will say inside of me, the Wild West cowboy entrepreneur, it gets frustrated sometimes because I like to move quickly. Luckily, we move incredibly fast and spending a lot of money allows us to learn very quickly. So I have no time to throw a tantrum and be sad because just things are moving so quickly. Um, it's high stakes poker. I mean, it's really what it is. Um, and it's freaking exhilarating, but it's also exhausting. So making sure that, you know, we're not just hitting our goals, but we're also feeling good about them. So we have like weekly calls about that stuff, but attribution I would say is, is, is a daily struggle daily. Mm. Well, I think it's, it's not something that's ever going to get solved hard and fast because it is such a gray concept. You know, it's, it's inherently not possible to, to just, uh, Anyway, man, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute blast and I'm sure people got so much out of it. Um, so cheers. And where, so where can people find you actually? Um, if anyone wants to know more or if anyone wants to chat to you. Um, yeah, so I'm on Instagram at Josh snow and then anything snow related is at snow, try Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm most active on uh, Facebook and Instagram, but I'm most active on Instagram in terms of, of of posting and stuff. So at Josh snow on Instagram. Awesome, man. And we'll have all of that in the show notes below. Thanks so much for coming on and talk soon, man. Thanks, brother. Awesome.